It's always great to start the service in the baptismal waters. As we think back to all of our journeys and the beginning of where it started and to where we are now. And today, London Perry comes and she has given her life to Christ and wants to follow that with baptism. London, you have a lot of people out there who love you. If you are here to, as a friend, a family member, to support London, would you please stand? Amen. London, what is your confession of faith today? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Well, upon your confession of faith, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in the newness of life. And London, as you go, remember that you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Go and let your light shine before all people. Amen. Join me as we read together. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and did not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you brought up my soul from shale, restored me to life from among those gone down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning.
grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We welcome you to Wilshire Baptist Church, and we are so delighted that you have chose to be with us this morning. If you are a guest, we ask that you would take time to fill out the response card, which is in your worship, worship guide, um, so that we may uh, get to know you just a little bit better. There are many things going on in the life of our church. Right now, our youth are headed that way to youth camp, so we ask that you would be in prayer for them and the youth sponsors as they go and be transformed uh, and loved by God and each other. Also, with this long weekend, I'm sure that you have many things planned out, but maybe you should add one more thing to that list. Uh, tonight at 6.30, we will have our patriotic concert here uh, at the church, and so we hope that you all will take time to come and hear the wonderful, fresh music that can uplift our souls. But let us now continue in worship. Reading from Galatians. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. This is the word of the Lord. Join me in prayer. Great is thy faithfulness, thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. God, may these words simmer in the depths of our being and remind us of your enduring character. This holiday weekend, amidst our celebrations, may we remember that freedom always costs someone something. This morning we pray for all those searching for freedom, whatever their entrapment may be. God, may you grant courage and boldness, power, and a sound mind. We pray for those who have and are currently fighting for the freedom of others in our community and all over the world. We thank you for their bravery in unthinkable situations and for their willingness to sacrifice on behalf of another. God, grant them immeasurable peace grace, and strength. We thank you for the many veterans who've looked into the eyes of the unprotected and saw them, and who've heard the cries of the vulnerable and answered them. This morning we pray for the thousands of veterans who are suffering from PTSD, depression, and suicidal ideation, and ask for your faithfulness, compassion, and mercy. God, we pray that our world would be entrenched with your surpassing peace. As dearly loved children, may we be the reflection of God who calls us to live in peace with ourselves and in peace with one another. This morning we pray for those who cannot be here due to sickness or injury and ask that you would provide the comfort and healing that is needed in their lives. We pray for Deanne, Janet, Ed, Betty, Lynn, David, Yvonne, and Dot. God of all comfort, we pray for your mercy and grace to surround those who are grieving the loss of a loved one this week. May your everlasting peace prevail. We pray for the Mason family on the death of their husband, father, and grandfather, George Mason Sr. Shirley Ann Lopez on the death of her brother, Thomas. Wilma Patterson on the death of her husband, William. The Cabanus family on the death of their father and grandfather, Chuck the Farner family on the death of their mother and grandmother, Rebecca. As we remember these things and many more, we pray the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
A reading from Luke. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If Baptists are known for anything, besides no drinking and no dancing, of course, at least those who don't go to Wilshire, <laughs> it is for their emphasis on missions. In fact, as many of you know, the father of modern missions, William Carey, was a Baptist. He traveled to India and made a huge impact in the world for Christ. He translated the Bible into several different languages so that people could hear about God and the gospel in their own language. He lived among people of great poverty and sickness in order that they might know the love and peace that a relationship with Jesus brings. The good news is that it didn't stop with Kerry, but it continues with us today. Our love for missions continues as we and many other churches send money so that missionaries can focus on the work they're doing. In recent years, the finances for missionaries has decreased relative to the decrease in overall church attendance. So denominational identities are having to rethink and restructure how we want to fund these missionaries so that we can keep sending them to do their ministry. In order to do this, CBF re had to rethink as well, and one adaptation happened at CBF General Assembly just a little over a week ago. While there, the fellowship voted to pay all the salaries and benefits of all of our field personnel, a great win for us and our missionaries. It's a great accomplishment and will allow CBF to continue sending and funding missionaries, and without having to raise money for their salaries, these missionaries will be able to focus on raising money that will go directly to funding their ministries. It will allow them to focus on the relationships they're building with the people in those places of service. And it will allow them to focus on the relationships and partnerships with churches back here in the, in the United States that are loving them and supporting them and encouraging them in their places of service. A great thing. And by us doing this, we, Wilshire, we, CBF, are accomplishing the task that Jesus has set out before us in this task today. It's the second wave that Jesus has sent. In chapter 9, he sent out, send out the 12, and now he's sending out 70 or 72. It depends on which scholar you read and, and, and talk to, uh, whether they think it's 70 or 72. But the main number is not the importance. What's important is the symbolic significance that the number has. It represents the expanded scope of the mission. It is not just a mission to go and preach the good news to Jews or the Hebrew people, but it's also now expanded to all nations, to all people. And Jesus is calling us to be part of that work. Even those who we may consider to be a piece of work still deserve to experience a work of peace in their lives. Peace is the message that we as Christians need to proclaim. 
Not just peace, meaning the absence of conflict, but a shalom type of peace, meaning completeness or wholeness. Jesus doesn't say, go in and knock on the door and ask them if they're prepared for Jehovah's return or if you died tonight, do you know if you'd go to heaven? No. That's not the method Jesus asks us to do. He says, offer the house peace. Give them the opportunity to experience wholeness. There's a sense of urgency in this passage about the importance of going. The urgency isn't because the kingdom of heaven begins when you die, but because it is near. It is here among us right now. It may be more likely we are among it. Knowing Christ means very little to people if it only has an effect after we die. The majority of Jesus' parables and sermons deal with how people's lives can be changed now, how they can experience a life of peace and love now that transcends the turmoil and the rigors of everyday life. There's people all around us who either need to know this peace of Christ for the first time or be reminded of the peace they received when they chose to follow this Jesus. The harvest is plentiful, not just for those that don't know, but even for those of us that do. As followers of Christ, we are called to help gather the harvest, to labor for the gospel for the sake of all people. There are many who have never known Christ at all and have never experienced the peace that comes with knowing him. It is our responsibility as followers of Christ to share that message of peace with them. No, it won't fix all their problems. No, it won't prevent them from ever feeling anxious again. But the peace of Christ allows people to move through that pain, to move through that anxiety, and it reminds them that Christ is present with them and continues to work and move in our lives in ways that we have no idea how to even begin to comprehend. But it's not just those who have never heard of Christ that need to know that peace. Even those of us who do know Christ need to be reminded of the power of peace that comes from knowing Christ. People are hurting in all kinds of ways. Some we know about, some we don't. Some are suffering from disease or illness and may not know what the future holds for them. Others may be troubled over a loss of a job or some form of rejection. Those people, we people, need to be reminded and affirmed that the peace of Christ is with us to comfort us. Who in your life is God sending you to offer peace? Is it a friend who you know that doesn't have the peace of Christ in their lives? Is it an estranged family member who you got in a fight with and haven't talked to in months or years? Or maybe there's someone in your workplace or neighborhood who you see all the time, but you've just never taken the time to stop and have a conversation with them. Because most of the time, it's as simple as that, having a conversation. Because it's when we have conversations that we get to know people, that we get to understand what kind of peace that these people need in their lives and how we can speak to that. Christ is calling all who follow him to join in the work. Nobody's sitting on the sidelines. He's giving us the opportunity to do what we can while giving us the assurance that he's going to do what we cannot. The pressure is off because we aren't responsible for results. So what's keeping you from participating? Jesus knows it's difficult. He says himself, I'm sending you out like lamb among wolves. And just to make it a little more difficult, don't take anything with you either. The mission to which Jesus calls us requires vulnerability. It requires us to let down our guard for the good of someone else. And often that vulnerability can lead to fear because we're not sure how other people are going to respond. We're going into a hostile world and there are occurrences where making ourselves vulnerable can also make us feel threatened. 
In his book, Your Brain at Work, David Rock cites that when we experience a threat, we one, think less clearly, two, have difficulty receiving and assimilating new information, three, make mistakes in perception and interpretation coming to false deductions, and four, we tend to respond negatively to situations focusing on the downside and taking fewer risks. In threatening moments, we often let our fear trump our faith. We begin taking self-inventory about the skills we have or that we don't have and if we know the correct things to say to people. When we feel threatened or feel for, fearful, it is important that we remember that as followers of Christ, the peace of Christ is with us and it is our job just to be faithful to the calling to go and offer peace to those who need it no matter how they respond. Often our internal fear and turmoil and fear of losing control of outcomes keeps us from creating peace for others. We can't control them, so what if we seek peace but they don't? Will Willeman writes this, let's be honest, our faith requires us to go toward the other without regard for whether or not the other takes a step toward us. Who in your life do you need to step toward today? Who do you consider other? Who makes you cringe? Who makes you uncomfortable? Who makes you feel out of control? And whoever that person or group of people is, is probably the people that you need to take a step toward. Jesus is calling. Again, the pressure's off. Jesus says if they don't respond positively, then move on. Shake the dust off your feet until you find someone who does respond positively. In a column this week for Baptist News Global, Bill Leonard recalls a time when he was a teenager and went on an evangelistic visit with his pastor. They walk up to the door and they knock. The guy answers the door, says, hello, we're from, hey, we're from the church. We'd like to visit with you. And he says, okay, come on in. Have a seat. So as they get through the small talk of the conversation with the TV blaring in the background still, the pastor looks at the man and says, do you know... Jesus as your Lord and Savior? The man said, no. And so the pastor then proceeds to share with him the plan of salvation and also share with him that he is lost and if he didn't accept Jesus that he could be lost forever, separated from God in this life and the next. So he asked the man, would you be interested or willing to say a a prayer to receive Jesus? No. I'm not ready. At least, not yet anyway. And the pastor looked him straight in the eye and said, Well, I guess you'll just have to go to hell, won't you? And out the door they marched. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not sure that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, Wipe the feet, shake the dust off of your feet and leave. And it's definitely not a message that left that man with any peace whatsoever. It's unfortunate that some, some people interpret this passage that way because it does so much more harm than good. It causes so much more turmoil than it does peace. Stories like this are often why we moderate Baptist Christians have become so gun-shy with the word evangelism. I think I just saw some of you like throw up in your mouth a little bit. (laughs) But although we don't agree with that method, that doesn't mean we should let the pendulum swing completely to the other side and avoid it altogether either. As people who know of and have experienced Christ's peace, we should join the few laborers and let Christ use us as his advocates to help bring hope and life to those who are in despair to comfort those who are mourning. It's the peace of Christ that helps transform lives, and that's the gospel message that people need to hear. Following Christ is so much more than a behavior modification program, and it's a shame how the message, that message 
of Christ gets diluted to that. There are people who are able to modify their behavior all the time who don't know Christ. People quit drinking, quit stealing, quit smoking, quit overeating, unless you're Baptist, all the time, and it has nothing to do with Christ. Knowing Christ and offering someone the peace of Christ goes far beyond changing behavior, even though that is one of the results. It changes and even saves lives. And people need to know that. And they're not going to hear it unless we tell them. A pastor friend of mine recently told me about a woman in his church who two years ago uh, started an affair with another man. Moved out of her house, left her husband and two kids behind. And her husband's a lot better man than I am because he refused to give up on her. He stayed with her. And in the midst of that two years, the teenage daughter came to the church and she met with the staff and the pastor and said, I just, I really need y'all to pray for my mom, to pray that my family will be restored. Well, eventually the mom did move back in, but was still having trouble dealing with her own stuff, having trouble with abandonment from some other members of her family that weren't her husband or her children. And so on Facebook one day she posted and said, I wonder where God is in my life. Where is God in all of this? Am I able to be forgiven? Am I able to forgive? And my friend saw that post on Facebook and sent her a message and said, it sounds like we need to talk. And she messaged him right back and said, when? I need to. And so when they met, she told my friend, she said, you know, when I had my affair, the church I was going to previously turned their back on me. And when the church turned their back on me, I felt like God turned God's back on me. And with sadness in his voice, he looked at her and said, no, no, no. That's the exact opposite of what just happened. God is loving you more than he's ever loved you. And God is running towards you. So the pastor ends up taking a risk, uh, maybe a risk, maybe not, but asked her to go as a sponsor to youth camp. And while at one of the worship services at camp, she said that she had an overwhelming peace come over her like she had never experienced before and it was the first time in her life that she had ever experienced the forgiveness of Jesus she gave her life to Christ and was baptized the next Sunday and the day she was baptized her daughter shared with the congregation she said two years ago I went to church camp and my focus was to pray for my mom and to pray that my family would be restored and that didn't happen. So the next year at camp, I prayed for my mom and I prayed for my family to be restored. And it didn't happen. But this year, my mom went to camp. And she was saved by Jesus Christ. And now the entire family is restored and at peace. Folks, offering hope and peace instead of despair is so much more than behavior change. This is the message that is so important for us to be telling. If we have experienced this way of peace, why in the world would we keep those who need to hear it from hearing it? We never know whose life needs to be changed and what one conversation about the message of Christ may do. If we want peace in the future, we need to work for peace now. Christ is with us, giving us peace as we share the peace of Christ with others. The harvest is plentiful. 
come join in the gathering. Amen. We have before us the table of peace, the table of reconciliation. This is the table to which scripture admonishes before we come, we are to make peace with those around us. If there is conflict, if there is dispute, to make that right, to seek peace and to come to this table then. Because this is a table that was created and born out of conflict and bondage. This meal has its roots in the Exodus, where the children of Israel lived in slavery and in bondage, and where Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And out of that flight from Egypt, we have this image of the unleavened bread and the cup that is taken and given new meaning by Jesus on that night when he gathered with his disciples in the upper room. We're reminded that in Galatians, we are told, for freedom, Christ has set us free. And on this weekend in which we remember our liberty as Americans, we must also be mindful that the root liberty we have is not because of our nationalism, but because of our citizenship in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. That is this meal before us. And so as we gather here today, I invite you to be attentive to the spirit of peace that is present as we take the bread and the cup and remember where it has come from and what it means to us. And as we ingest this, these tangible symbols, may the spirit of Christ flow into us and cause us to remember that for freedom, Christ has set us free. It's not for our own sake, but it's for the sake of the world that we are free. It was on that night when Jesus gathered his disciples in the upper room that he took the bread they had seen before. But this time as he broke it, he said to them, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat, all of you. And in the same way, he took the cup, which had always been at the table before, but this time, as he poured it, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of it. Let us pray. Holy God, bless this bread and this cup, and may they be reminders to us, symbols and a change agent to us in this moment on this day of the power of your love to escape from bondage and find freedom in Christ. As we partake of these, may your Holy Spirit fill us and grant us peace, not only for our sake, for, but for the sake of the whole world. We pray through Jesus Christ. Amen.
the body of Christ, the bread of peace. We lift this cup to you, O Lord, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. And now, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Would you please stand and share signs of Christ's peace with one another? Peace with you, Charles.
Peace with you, Carol. Good. Peace with you, Heather. Peace, Timothy. There's been a lot of peace today. And we want you to be a piece of our church. Oh, that's bad. That's worse than George. <laughs> but in all honesty, we are glad you're here today. Uh, and if you are here and you aren't a part of this body, we would love for you to come be a part and join us in serving the world for Christ. Maybe you're here and you're troubled by something and you need somebody to pray with. I want to give you the freedom today to go grab somebody and say, hey, will you pray for me? Feel free to come down here and grab me. Whatever you need to do. Maybe you need to receive Christ for the first time. Whatever you need to do today, have the freedom, feel the freedom. It is Fourth of July after all. To do whatever you feel led to do. Let's sing. being at church today. I always like to say it's better when you're here. And uh, have a good 4th of July. I hope you don't have to work. And if you do, you can find peace in that misery as well. Uh, but, uh, but as we go to celebrate, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he lift his countenance upon you and be gracious unto, unto you. And give you peace and the courage to share that peace with all you come in contact with. Amen.